Ladies and gentlemen, um, before I begin, actually, I'm going to correct my, our esteemed um, uh -oh. our esteemed organiser. Um, you seem to be conflating David and Laurie, David Steele and Laurie Rantler, because Laurie was the stu was a PhD student at Chicago, and David was a PhD student at Hull, and eventually he was awarded a PhD on the basis of the book. But anyway, <laughs> okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin by defining the word socialism. Despite what people may tell you, and despite what Wikipedia may tell you, Karl Marx did not distinguish satisfactorily between socialism and communism. Insofar as he talked about socialism and communism, he used the words interchangeably to describe a future which was characterised by the complete absence of private property and the complete absence of the market, right? The, it was a later generation of Marxists who distinguished between the two concepts. For Stalin, socialism was state ownership of the means of production and still some reliance on markets of a sort. You had a labour market and so on. And communism was the later and final stage characterised by the abolition of private property and the market, and that was some way in the future. So what, Mar what Marx interchangeably called socialism and communism became communism in the 20th century with socialism as a prior, prior concept, as a, pr as a prior stage, I should say. Um, and also it ought to be said, just clarify this for people, is that socialism often refers to a welfare state with or without large-scale nationalisation of industry. And after the Second World War, in Europe, you had a lot of welfare states, some like Sweden, which actually did not nationalise the industry for the most part. You think of Volvo Cars, it was a privately owned organisation. In Britain, they went in for the commanding heights of the economy. This is, if you like, a bit of a Marxist influence there. And they, they, they nationalised coal and steel and uh, transport and um, gas, electric and, and so on, uh, uh, which were eventually denationalised under Thatcher. But um, socialism can mean different things to different people. And, um, I mean, one could be far more subtle than what I, I'm saying at the moment. But I, I, but I want to just make it quite clear that when we're talking about, when Mises talks about the problem of economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth, he's talking about the the future, the, the, mil, the millennium ahead, right, okay, where the, uh, which is characterised by the absence of private property and the absence of the market, right? And the word socialism is often used rather in a weakened and um, watered down sense in the 20th century and also over here when people accuse people of being a bomb of being a socialist, right? Okay, it, 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 so Obama has never proposed <laughs> the abolition of private property and the market economy. Uh, he has an interest in private property, right? And he makes sure that the privileges go to certain people in the private, private economy. Um, so, you know, we've got to be very careful what we mean. But for Mises, though, remember, Mises is writing in the 1920s, and it's, uh, and it's after, <coughs> excuse me, and it's, um, we're coming out of the 19th century, right? Marx dies in 1883, two years, by the way, after Mises is born. Their lives overlap by two years. Anyway, so Marx dies in, 18, in 1883. And then, of course, Marxism is you know, a powerful force, intellectual force, and it heavily influences socialist parties in Europe, right? Okay? And there was always an element that was Marxist in the Labour Party, although in Britain, actually, Britain, there was surprisingly little influence, actually, compared with, say, Germany, where the um, Socialist Party of Germany had a big Marxist element, right? Okay? And there were, they were far more, far more adhering to Marx, or what they thought was Marx. Um, so when Mises is writing in his famous article in 1920, that was where he stated the argument, and then he included it in his masterwork, Socialism and Economic and Sociological Analysis in 1922. Right, that's the book that, um, that's the book which um, Patrick was talking about. Okay. Um, he's, he's, he's gunning for socialism as Marxists understand it at that time which is coming out of Marx right, okay, coming out of Marx what, what, what you might say, communism stroke socialism um, in fact David when he wrote, he started writing this book in the 70s and I'll tell you more about this later 
and a little outfit with which I was connected called Libertarian Press uh, uh, was going to publish this and then we never did um, but uh, he hadn't written the whole thing at that time and we were, he was going to call it we were going to call it uh, the impossibility of communism right thinking of communism as being you know Mar- Marxian communism right which would also of course mean what Stalin meant by communism which is this millennium where there is no private property and no market right it would be the impossibility of communism and uh, of course the problem with saying the impossibility of communism particularly in the United States is well, well it's not impossible we've got the Soviet Union right <laughs> so clearly that wasn't really going to work as a title and uh, um, I mean, it might more have worked in Britain but even there people are going to say well of course it's communism right it's not impossible we've got it right <laughs> it's the Soviet Union right they've got their weapons trained at us so, um, so consequently that's why the title that's why the book was then to rechange it was changed the title from Marx to Mises post-capitalist society and the challenge of economic calculation and rather coyly David on the back tells us that he was um, a native in Edinburgh, Scotland he was, born in Sco- he was born in Scotland but he grew up in Birmingham, England graduated in sociology from the University of Hull subsequently he got his PhD on the basis of this book um, Steele is now editorial director of a publishing house in Chicago a little bit coy because it's the publishing house that published the book anyway um, <laughs> and he's since, since then published other books by him. Um, he's a bit, he actually David, David um, was a journalist uh, he left school at 16 um, he was a journalist um, he tells me that the first time he ever encountered a telephone this is Britain remember and the standard of living wasn't as high in Britain then as it is now and he didn't have a I mean I had many friends who didn't have phones in their home and David came from quite a poor background and didn't have a phone in his home and the first time when, he, when the phone went at work right when he was a journalist a trainee journalist right, on the local Birmingham newspaper um, the phone rang and he wasn't quite sure what to do he picks it up and goes, what do we do <laughs> I remember him telling me that story anyway so he was 16 in 1960 when he when he left school and um, uh, got a job as a trainee journalist and then later on he became a mature student at the University of Hull in the 90. 19- he went up in 68, I think, so that would make him 22 when he went to college. That's really quite rare, particularly in Britain at that time, for people to actually go back to college in their 20s. There were places that were set up for that. Birkbeck College London, uh, Ruskin College Oxford, um, and other universities would take people, but there's far fewer people would be going back to university in, the 20, you know, in their 20s and 30s, and that's more, more, more common now. Anyway, David went, back to, went to university, finally, when he was 22, um, uh, or was he, was he 20 maybe he was 20 66, 68 anyway and he got a bachelor's degree right in sociology in fact and then what, he was a good student very good writer by the way he writes very very well um, and he then um, was going to uh, get his PhD so that when I knew him he was working on his PhD and it was going to be he was a Marxist right socialist right as as Marxists call themselves, right? They call themselves socialists, right? Even if the word socialist means lots of different things to different people, as I'll explain. And uh, he was going to write a book about Marx, right? About Marx's Das Kapital. And he's one of the few people. <laughs> there's, precious, there's a lot of Marxists who've never read Das Kapital, I can tell you. Uh, but anyway, he'd read Das Kapital. He'd read twice, right? For all three volumes, all three turgid volumes. Which is, uh, was nothing, something I have no plans ever to do in the rest of my life. Anyway, so that's, that's Das Kapital. He'd read, read Das Kapital. He's reading it through again. All right, so that was what he was going to write his thesis on. Anyway, um, so let's go back, let's go back a little bit to 1920. This evening I have in mind um, Ludwig Mises' argument about the impossibility of rational economic calculation in what he calls a socialist commonwealth. Let me be quite precise what Patrick mentioned and what I mentioned. In other words, is it possible to calculate rationally in a society where there is no institution of private property and there are no markets. Markets turn on private property, right? Private property enables you to trade and in the process of trade, uh, prices, uh, prices emerge, right? The, the whole, whole emphasis is, spontan- is, the, is the undesigned order, right? The spontaneous order of the market. Right, okay. So, that's the question. Now, for, me, for Marx and Engels, they didn't really pay very much attention to this question, actually, of how the whole system's going to function. And in fact, in a, something I'm going to tell you about in a minute, 
there's a passage by Engels which is just ludicrous actually as to how this thing could work. It will, will be hours of labour, right? Okay, hours of labour. That's that would enable us to solve the problem. I mean, nobody now would really think that you could solve the problem. No Marxist would think now you could solve the problem in that way. Now, I don't want to be too harsh on Marx and Engels, because after all, Marx and Engels did write a lot of stuff about a lot of topics, and I think there is some, I think there is actually some merit in some of the things they talked about. But certainly, <laughs> their strong point was not, <laughs> was not how markets function. Um, let's put it like that, let's be kind. We'll be charitable this evening, after a few couple of glasses of wine, we'll be charitable. Um, <laughs> Mises, Mises argued that if monetary calculation is to be employed in directing production, two conditions must hold. These are a market in higher order goods, in other words, in capital goods, and a universally employed medium of exchange, meaning money. Right? You can't, so, the crucial point is a market in capital goods. And that gives rise then, if you like, to capitalism. It's actually not a phrase I'm particularly keen on. It's got a lot of other connotations to it. So I don't go around saying I'm a capitalist or even I'm a narco-capitalist. Um, but I... Um, so I, I, I'm not keen on the word. But in the sense of capitalism meaning a market in capital goods, then yes, that is a necessary for, for a modern society that's characterised by division of labour. Um, and that's what Mises argued. Now, you could say, well, you could have barter, right? We don't have money, we have, we have this market in capital goods, but it's all bartered. But the problem is, of course, the barter, barter is only makes any, can only really function on a very, very limited basis, right? Because we're talking about thousands, I mean, it's not just like what's the price of steel and what's the price of concrete, it's what's the price of 50, 50 different sorts of screw, right? Or, or 500 different products, sorts of screw. All of which are capital goods, right? All of which are capital goods. And when we say capital goods, what we mean, we, we, and higher order goods, higher order goods are the good, are in contrast to first order goods, which are consumer goods, all right? That's the distinction that's being made. So consumer goods are things like the chair, and the glass of wine, and, and so on, right? The higher order goods are the capital and the land and the labour that goes into making the wine, right? And that goes in and it goes into making the machinery with which you 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 harvest the grapes. So you have this huge uh, per, per, uh, structure of production, right? Austrians are very good on structure of production. Uh, we won't go there now, but that's what we mean by the capital market. Mises actually said that you could, you, you could avoid, I mean he didn't recommend this of course, because having a market in consumer goods in that is, is actually more efficient, but he, think, he thought you could actually do away, you could avoid having a market in consumer goods, but what you couldn't avoid doing was having a market in capital goods, right? And, and first order goods, and that means, the pri that means not just capital, right? But it, and, and every sort of capital, every sort of intermediate product, every sort of raw material, but also the prices of land, different sorts of land, land that's suitable for cultivating grapes, land that's suitable for building, right? And labour, all the different sorts of labour that go into making goods, right? Okay, so you had to have markets in that. And there's no way those markets could function without money. There's no way they could function because there's so many products, there's millions and millions of products Right, which are these intermediate products that go into making consumer goods, and that therefore you need to have, right? You need to, you need to have um, money, right? There's no way in which barter could suffice. So those are the two minimally necessary conditions for rational economic calculation, according to Mises. Right now, Mises, okay, these. These, up till then, there have been a lot of people who are sympathetic to the market, who are hostile to. Socialism and Marxism. Remember at that time, Marxism and Socialism, right? Okay, it can be equated. Anyway, so, and they felt the need to reply. But you know, the arguments would tend to be in terms of incentives. If you don't pay people, they won't produce. Now, there may be a considerable amount of truth in that. But that was the nature of the sort of arguments that were sketched at that time. They really didn't grapple with the inherent impossibility of calculation of rational calculation, rational economic calculation, in a sophisticated society characterised by the extreme division of labour and exchange, which is what Europe and North America, and for that matter the whole world in a way, right, was engaged on in, say, 1914, or even as early as 1850, or even as early as 1800, right? Okay, you go further back, 
very sophisticated networks of exchange. And um, uh, so, so we have this incentive argument, which I don't want to dismiss entirely, but that doesn't really get to the grips with it. And in fact, there were a number of people who sort of began to sort of talk about these things. And actually a Dutchman called Nicholas G. Pearson in 1902, really got to the point about the... This is prior to Mises, actually. Uh, really got to the argument about uh, the role of value and, the, and how could you possibly calculate value in a socialist commonwealth, right? The problem is, however, it was a more like a sort of a scattergun approach. Oh, well, here, what about this? What about that? What about this? It was Mises in 1920 who put it all together and expounded it satisfactorily, right? So that's the credit for Mises. Not that Mises was the first person to come up with these ideas entirely, but it was Mises the first to put it all together and to expound it as one, one coherent argument in an article in 1920, which wasn't translated. This is part of the problem with the reception of Austrian economics in the 20th century. These people are writing in German and they don't get translated into English. After all, Menger's first book wasn't translated into English until 1950, 1950 or 51, right? That was written in 1871 wasn't available. Um, Mises' 1920 article was translated as one of several articles in the, um, on collectivist economic planning put together by Hayek in 1935, which also included, um, uh, included Pearson's article and included Mises. And then in 1936, uh, uh, Robbins got his friend uh, or fellow student, Kahan, K-A-H-A-N-E, to translate socialism. And that was came out by Cape in 1936 and came out over here, I think, Hardcore Brace. Anyway, but um, that, that, so these things often take a long time to get into the English language. It's one reason why English-speaking economists, right, uh, often don't really engage with the Austrian arguments. In fact, there's a footnote. Um, what's the time? Footnote, okay, here is that Keynes reviews theory of money and credit in the Economic Journal in 1913-14, right? The book came out in German in 1912, and it wasn't translated until many, many years later into English. So Keynes, who's a very smart guy, don't misunderstand me, uh, is reviewing it in, when it comes out in the Economic Journal the following year. And the story I'd heard is he didn't actually read German, or I guess he spoke a little bit of German, I mean, he's an educated guy, and so on, but that he couldn't really get to grips with a detailed book in German. And I read the review, right, and it struck me that he was make, he was, I don't know if this is true, the story, to be honest, but it struck me, though, that he could have written this review without having read the whole of the book, right? So the way the review is, read, is, the, is written, right, the way he dismisses him, he doesn't really engage with, with Mises. It did strike me that he could have read, you know, a smattering of German, which I'm sure is better than my German, uh, reads the first, you know, section or so, and then, and then, and then submit, submits a, a brief uh, a review. But anyway, that is an illustrative, it's not really, the, well, I suppose it is a little bit of a, a little, a little bit of a joke at Keynes, a little bit of a remark at Keynes' expense, but it's really what I want to focus on is the fact that the, a lot of these German writers, right, took, were just not in, discussed among English-speaking economists, and that means Brits and Americans, right, because they weren't translated into English and they didn't read, English, and they didn't read German. I mean, a few did, but, but most of them didn't. Anyway, so, um, uh, so, so that's, that's the argument by Mises. I'll be very brief now. Okay, I, all right. Um, it is not... A, now, Hayek, in his, inter, in his forward to this, mentions, in passing, how he himself was something of a socialist and was... I, not keen on the word converted, but <laughs> was persuaded that he was erroneous by, re by studying under Mises, because he studied under Mises, the Mises Christ in Vienna. Um, and he also mentions Wilhelm Repke, right, and he mentions, um, where are we, uh, Lionel Robbins, right, Lionel Robbins, the LSE. And, and Robbins is the one who gets Hayek to come to the LSE. And Robbins also acknowledges the debt to Mises in, say, his famous essay, an essay on the nature and significance of economic science. So there was a generation, or some of his generation, we'll say, that were persuaded by the Misesian argument. And what I want to briefly do now, and I've already sort of alluded to it, is to recount the story, as I know it, of a handful of Marxists who were also persuaded by Mises' argument in the 1960s, 1970s, I'm sorry. 
Uh, David Ramsey Steele was a committed Marxist and socialist, but he was a member of a very small socialist group, very quite venerable history, formed in 1904, the Socialist Party of Great Britain. And if you go, you can find their website right now on the web, and you can read all about them. Right? They're still going. Right? They're very actually they're very proud of the fact that they have they did not support. They are the only I think they're the only Marxist group that did not support either world war at all because as you can imagine in the second world war once the Soviet Union got attacked by the Nazis um, uh, then, and, and, and then the, the Soviet Union came in then of course they were in favour of fighting Hitler right okay and, and on the, you know, given that this is the, this is the proper, proper uh, course for a communist supporter support of the Soviet Union to do is to support them on this matter um, but the Soviet, but Socialist Party of Great Britain was always anti, anti-war and they never supported either war anyway um, because they were sort of like, depicted as goody-goody, they were nicknamed by the left as a small party of good boys, Socialist Party of Great Britain. Right? And they were opposed to reformism, and they were advocates of class struggle, like any other good, good Marxist, but through the ballot box and Parliament, and that's the sense in which they were goody-goody, right? Okay? They were in favour of the ballot box and Parliament, and the point was they, were ref- they believed that you wouldn't achieve socialism until you until you had an intellectual renaissance, right? In other words, you actually persuade people of the merits of socialism as they see it, right? Now, David Ramsey Steele comes out of that tradition, which is the power of argument, and that you can't speed things up by, by you know, uh, in, in any way that you've really ultimately got to convert people. And, you, you know, you convert the public intellectuals who then persuade other people, Right? Um, the Socialist Party of Great Britain put the emphasis on, you know, winning elections and getting into Parliament and changing the way that the world worked that way. But, um, uh, but it was part of a tradition of engagement and, and certainly not one of violence, right? The most Marxist groups, you know, in favour of the moment comes, you seize it and you man the barricades, right, and you're in there, right? Okay, or, or maybe you're in prison, but anyway, whatever it is, it's seizing the opportunity and it's quite happy to reuse violence. The Socialist Party of Great Britain was totally opposed to violence in that sense, actually. And Steele reflected that. Steele reflected that. So I rather liked David when I met him at the whole University Debating Society in the fall of 1969 when I went up to do a Master's in Monetary Economics. Anyway, I got talking, and another fellow, a friend of ours there, Chris Tay, got talking to David Ramsey Steele. I suppose it was really more me who talked to him because I was there in the Hull University Debating Society and Chris Tay didn't really take part in the debates. Um, but I, I talked to David and uh, introduced him to libertarian arguments and Misesian arguments. And then in a letter of, I think, I still have the letter, but it's in storage in England, so I couldn't consult it for this talk. I think it was a letter of January 1973, but I may be off, it may be 72, but I think it's 73. David wrote to me saying he had been persuaded by the, by the Misesian argument. And as I said, he ditched his uh, thesis on Marx's capital to write a critique of Marx, or Marx's economic argument. It's a fa- fabulous book. He does write really well. And uh, then, as I said, later on, he found that they would give him a PhD on the strength of the book. So he applied for it and filled the necessary paperwork and got a PhD from Hull University on the strength of it. Anyway, um, so, and friends of his, Marxist friends of his became libertarians as well, who are friends of mine, um, on the strength of Mises' argument. And I, I really, I mean, I, as generous as Patrick to say this, perhaps, Marx is the one who converted David to libertarianism, but I always say, no, I didn't, because... David, I introduced him to ideas, and this is surely all that we can ever expect when we engage with people. We introduce them to ideas, we leave the seed for them in their minds, they read it. I remember David saying to me, very, very early on, actually, soon after I met him in 69, uh, saying to me that, you know, when somebody puts a view that is opposed to yours, right, your initial reaction is, you know, you, you, you don't expect the person to... You, after all, you're asking them to throw out what well, their views that they held their views are. This is part of them, right? Okay? But what happens is if, if the idea takes hold and they're interested, they're a little bit disturbed. There's something niggling there, they haven't quite answered. And David was a very intellectually honest person. So he was going to deal with this, right? So he'd come back and he'd ask a question and he'd say, read you know, read me. I'd engage him in the arguments perhaps and things and we went backwards and forwards. And one thing he said to me that you find that people do is this. He said, 
they don't say uh, they, they don't say uh, what okay they don't want to say that, that they may be wrong but they, they say well there was this friend of mine who said <laughs> and it's always like that right and, and, and so on and, but, but eventually if people are intellectually honest you can change their views but please please they are changing they are choosing they are choosing in the light of the material that you've read you've lent them and the arguments you've had with them all to your credit but um, they are ultimately the ones who choose to make that change in their minds Right? Okay, they change their views. And some of them do and some of them don't. Okay? So, anyway, so I, what I would like to say is take ideas very seriously. And uh, that surely should be. And Mises took ideas very seriously, after all. Right? So, let's have a toast to Mises. No? Yeah. <laughs>